I surmise by the fact that all of you are wearing masks and sitting socially distanced apart from one another, you all got the memo that Peter's not here today uh, because he contracted COVID, which turns him off in this position that the sermon he wants to deliver about this incredible journey he has had in these last couple of weeks is now going to be probably in two parts, not one. Um, anyway, I'm glad to be here today to uh, offer worship for you folks, and albeit not maybe for the reason that I would have liked, um, I'm, I am happy to be here, and it's great to see all of you this morning. Today we're going to call Twin Sunday, because we're celebrating the twin birthdays of Anne and Mary Mills, and also Greg and Allison Hitler. So, I, so appropriate, we should have some happy birthday music for that. Yeah. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Mary Mills. Happy birthday to you. announcements this morning. Other than the fact that I'm all excited to see what the hall floors look like. I'm sure they look, they're dry by now, right Jim? Okay. A middle-aged man was running around the track around his high school football stadium while the guys were practicing. And he thought to himself, you just saw the guys get up and they were running their sprints up and down the field towards the end of practice. He said, well, I'll keep jogging until those guys are finished with their sprints. And so they began running. And he began running. And this continued on for quite some time. And finally, he got pretty exhausted and decided he needed to stop. One of the football players ran over to him and said, thank God you stopped. He said, because we were told by the football coach we had to keep running until that old guy over there kept running around the field. <laughs> Today we look at what is needed to run the race. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
rise as you are able and follow along in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Let all who would serve the risen Christ enter the house of the Lord. May and all that we do or say be pleasing in the sight of God. May our labors and our leisure be worthy of God's chosen children. And may we bring honor and praise to the Lord through our lives. That all around us may one day join us in lifting praise unto the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our opening hymn number 86. take advantage of opportunities in life in which you have placed us. Too often instead, we have complained or found fault, or been unwilling to simply serve you to the best of our ability and allow you to work through our lives. Forgive us, Lord, and call us to you to do all that we do for you. In Christ we pray. Amen. To all who seek forgiveness through confession of sin and commitment to change, God responds with mercy and grace. Ever and always, God welcomes us to home to live with joy in the world and to look with hope toward the time ahead. Let us now walk in truth, finding the freedom as we celebrate Christ's life and relying on the Spirit's power. These things we do by the grace of God. Good morning. Good morning. The first scripture 
is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike the blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The second lesson, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the Lord direct our thinking and speaking, and our hearing, that we may fully know you. And let your word be our lamp in all darkness and doubt. Amen. Brother Peter figured that since I was preaching today, the sermon should have a sports theme. Now, I know Anne and Mary have been watching the Olympics. Anybody else? Yeah. Wasn't it nice that they had that opening ceremony on their birthday? Yeah. <laughs> Most of us take the Olympics and all its grand pageantry for granted. A, a sporting staple every two years and elicits patriotism and incites wonder and marvel. The Olympics began in ancient Greece in the year 776 B.C., to be exact. The Greeks were said to take their fun seriously, even become the world's first sports fans. But all the Olympics was nothing like the modern manifestation, although the athletes still ran and they wrestled, they jumped, they boxed, they threw javelins, and they put shots. Now, there's been some controversy of late over the Olympians' immodest attire. But you might be interested to know in the beginnings, the athletes wore no clothes at all. Naked, zip, not, nothing. The participants were men only, and in some cases, the athletes' commitment was so great that some died in the sense of the competition, rather than surrender and admit defeat. For the ancient Greeks, the Olympics were about the elevation of the humankind to the level of the divine. There was a direct correlation between athletic and religious discipline. And that's when Roman Emperor Theodius arrived on the scene, also known as, at least among his friends, Theodius the Great. He, had, he was baptized as a Christian amid his reign. The popular narrative that's inspired by his faith in Christ, Theodius banned the Olympics back in 393 AD. He saw the contest as a pagan cult activity and a reflection of idolatrous body worship. <laughs> and so he officially broke up the long-held tradition. After all, the Olympics were part of the religious games to honor Zeus. While there's no evidence the odious rule that the games were illegal, it's likely that his action put an end to the popular aspects of the games. Documents suggest that athletic competition in Greece continued for the next century before fading away for nearly 1,500 years. Enter French aristocrat Baron Pierre de Coubertin, a gentleman who said to be inspired by the muscular Christianity movement. Now this movement took hold in the middle of the 1800s and emphasized the masculine expression of faith. This especially manifested itself in sports, fitness, and morale. At the time, most church attendees were women. So this new and exciting turn helped to draw men back to church. What about the Jews? In the United States, Teddy Roosevelt was a big, strong, and vocal proponent of this movement. Now, Baron Cooperton helped to reintroduce the worldwide competition in Athens in 1896. He became the president of the International Olympic Committee and the New Games' primary ambassador. In 1935, looking back on the evolution of the world, he reflected, the most important thing in the Olympic Games is not to win, but to take part. Just as the most important thing in life is not to triumph, but to struggle. The essential thing is not to have conquered, but to have fought well. Now I want all of you to remember that the next time the Phillies are up by or down at the, by one run in the bottom of the ninth inning and they leave a runner on third base. <laughs> Cooperton knew that there was more to competition than winning and losing. And as a believer in Christian who especially uh, appreciated the Apostle Paul, that brings us to the scripture of today. Paul was certainly aware of the Olympic Games during his travels through Greece. 
In his first letter to the believers in Corinth, he used the analogy of the games as a measure of self-control. Paul is telling us that in a way, Christians are all in the Olympics. We are running the race that determines our eternal abode. We run to win, and the prize is the most valuable we will ever seek. No money or property can purchase it. Only self-control under the banner of Christ grants a chance for winning. Perhaps you remember in high school or trot or college, trying out for the varsity or junior varsity baseball or track, tennis or football team. The competition was keen and you tried your level best. And finally, when the tryouts were concluded, a day or so later on the bulletin board in the athletic department, everything was uh, right there in front of you. You stood there and you read the list of those who made the team. Either your name was there or was conspicuously absent. Joy or disappointment prevailed. St. Paul is speaking to you, Justin, this morning and is saying, Congratulations, you've made the team. The race has already begun. When did we make the team? It was in that defining moment when the sign of the cross was traced in your forehead and your pastor spoke those life changing words I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At that gracious moment, all that Christ accomplished for us in his life, death, and resurrection became ours. Yes, you've made the team, and the race had begun. You could consider our first text from Corinthians as the bulletin board announcing we've made the team. And our second text from Hebrews takes the next step and lays down the training that guides us to the finish line. So let's begin, notebook in hand, we mustn't let the team down. Our first training rule tells us to keep our memory alert. Paul writes, but what of ourselves, with all these witnesses of faith around us like a cloud, let us run. Reverend James Moffat said that this section of scripture is one of the most moving passages of the New Testament. And in it we find a well-perfect summary of the Christian life. Here we see the Christian's inspiration as he enters life's race. We are asked to remember the cloud of witnesses who have run the race before us. Those dear loved ones are witnesses in a twofold sense, for they bear witness to their own faithfulness to Christ. And they now they witness our performance. The Christian is like a runner in a crowded stadium. As he presses on, the crowd looks down, and the crowds who watch him are those who have already won the race. What an inspiration they are to each of us, and what a mark they have left on our lives. The second of our training rules remind us to keep the steady pace and run with the resolution, the race in which we are in. Our pace is to be a measure. It is to be with resolution, with patience or perseverance. But it is not a patience that can sit down, bow its head, let things descend on it, and passively endure until the storm subsides. This patience does not follow an easy path. No Christian, whatever his age, is to emulate the man who on his 100th birthday was asked the secret of his longevity. He said, just taking the gifts of the Creator. He answered, he made the night for sleeping and the day for resting. Nothing of the kind for the Christian athlete. His pace possesses a spirit that can accept life, not simply resignation, but with blazing hope. It is not a patience which grimly waits for the end, but for the resolution that radiantly plans for the dawn. The third training rule advises us to keep our eyes on the goal. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom faith depends from start to finish. 
1968, a church was being built in Honolulu. The architect asked the pastor to give him a text to be carved in the chancel over the, altar, over the altar. It was an interesting commission, for the architect said it must not contain more than 18 letters. It was to be present something of significant to people of many moods. The text must share the joy of Christmas and be in harmony with the stem note of Good Friday. And when Easter morning comes, it must still be true and luminous with the vision of eternity. Youth in middle age must understand its message of challenge and responsibility. And when the old and the age looked up at the text, it should compel them to say, Yes, that's so. I know, for life has proved that to me. The inscription must have permanence in it. There must be something ever old, ever new, and eternal about it. So with these varying needs and requirements of permanence in mind, the pastor chose the text, Love Never Failed. And there it stands, high above the altar, where all who lift their eyes may read. Love never fails. The love of Christ revealed at the cross is eternal. And beyond that, the love you have given and continue to give is eternal, for it is linked with the one who is love incarnate. The love you give to others is not lost, for we will meet again one day. The love you give to Christ is not lost. It binds you to him in bonds that nothing can break. For even beyond death, love goes on loving. For love never fails. In short, we have love. We love. We shall love. Thank God this is true. So keep your eyes on the goal. Congratulations, you've made the team. So we have a concern for Brother Peter, but he seems to be faring pretty well with the COVID that he's dealing with. Do we have any other joys and concerns that we want to share this morning? Thank you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Gracious God, we offer this prayer as people seeking to mature in faith and striving to contribute all we can to building up the community that gathers in Christ's name. Forgive us when our seeking loses its intensity or focus, when our striving gets lethargic or goes in undesirable directions. Forgive us for our unkindness. We have allowed our words to be more hurtful than healing and have succumbed to judgmental attitudes. Forgive us for our indifferences. We have constricted our caring by turning away from problems we would rather not see, and by extending only a safe and selective form of compassion. Forgive us for our unavailability. We have shied away from callings to exercise our talents in your service, and made ourselves spiritually or emotionally inaccessible to others who need us. Allow us to become confident and engaged in your service to others. Enable us to be people who observe with prayerful attention the events and relationships that build our human history. We ask your guiding hand to help those who have suffered atrocities and to help those who can repair the damage that is done whenever violence punctuates peace or lurks about as a threat of harm. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
part in teammates to go out and run the race in this world in Christianity. Abide in you and in those you love. Grace, mercy, and peace through God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit.